to all the viewers of this uh, streamed chat with our rector. It's a chat, uh, a, a chat about our sermons over the last few, little while. And each week, um, a parishioner uh, asks Desiree some questions. And I'd like to introduce you to Desiree. She's our rector. And uh, we're not trying to trick her, we're trying to uh, <laughs> discover some of the things that we didn't glean that we might have. So, okay, so last week uh, the sermon was on a, a chapter 10 from Mark's Gospel. And uh, it was basically about two of the disciples, James and John, and uh, they were asking Jesus if they could sit with him in glory uh, on his left and his right when the time came. And uh, Jesus uh, started to explain about those things and that's where we pick up the story. So uh, would you like to elaborate on what Jesus meant when he was talking to James and John about you'll drink the same cup as me and you'll be baptised in the same way as I? Yeah, so... It, each person would uh, read that text, uh, I think, in a different way. My understanding is um, that it's the cup of suffering. So when Jesus is in the Garden of Gethsemane, it's the night before he dies, and he's terrified about what's about to happen. And one of his prayers is, please, Lord, if it be your will, can you take this cup of suffering from me? And, you know, he eventually, as you know, goes through... Uh, with everything. So in, in the Gospel of Mark, to, to follow the way of Jesus means that you'll bear some of the consequences that Jesus bore in a decision to stand in solidarity with, with the poor and the marginalised. Namely, you'll be a threat to the status quo, whether that status quo is political governance or uh, ecclesiastical governance, the temple authority, um, uh, there'll be consequences for that. So it's the generalised suffering that happens when you make a decision for radical discipleship. Yeah, okay. And, and does that cover what he meant by you'll be baptised with the same... Yeah. Yes. Okay. Yes. Yeah. So it's just the experience of Maybe you have a particular worldview that you try to align with the worldview of Jesus, and that's not met with favour among friends and family. So maybe there's rejection. So that that could be. Yeah. be well, it's one another thing. level, isn't it? Of what could happen? Yeah. Yes, and the decision, the a decision to uh, speak out against. Well, in our country, we don't feel the suffering as. Uh, significantly, <clears throat> but for, for example, if we were running a refugee agency and we were registered with the not-for-profit charities commission in Australia and we saw how refugees are treated on the ground because of some of the policies of government uh, and we chose to speak up about those conditions, we would lose funding. Mm, okay. So that could be one example. If you're an environmental charity and you speak up about political policies mm -hmm. that affect the environment, you, you threaten your funding and your status as a charity. A couple of, uh, it's probably about a year ago now, all charities registered with the not-for-profit Australia Commission got a letter. So that would be a modern day example of of the sort of pressure that's put on people that are a little bit uh, adverse to the government. Yes, or just standing in solidarity with w with the with the marginalised, the suffering people. Yeah. yeah. Okay. The third question I have is that uh, when Jesus is talking to James and John and he's telling them that he can't. Uh, guarantee that they're going to be sit on his left and his right. What is he alluding to? 
So it's, he's, what's happening there is Jesus uses the word Messiah and the disciples misunderstand the content of that word. So they are presuming that <clears throat> Jesus will come in, sort out the Romans once and for all, and that there would be this new movement. Yeah. Okay. And Jesus would be in charge. In his glory. <laughs> in his glory. And they would be second in command to IC. Yeah. They were a big ask, weren't they? Yeah. They had a yeah. bit of an ego. <laughs> uh, hu huge ego. But what Jesus, the type of Messiah Jesus imagines himself to be, is inspired by the suffering servant songs in Isaiah. So he's been trying to speak to them about the nature of his messiahship being suffering servant, crucifixion and all of that, and they just don't get it. It's just so out of their world view that they just don't grasp it. Yeah, interesting. One of my questions later is about how you've mentioned and how outsiders often see more clearly mm. what is meant by say, the kingdom of God or yeah, that, other, other things. Yeah, yeah that, that's a particular feature of Mark's gospel, but I've often found it to be true, and I can give some examples of that. But James and John are imagining thrones. Yes. But Jesus is clear that it's a cross, so uh, he doesn't know who's going to be crucified with him because who can predict the future? No. So okay. they don't know that the that the throne that Jesus is talking about is yeah. in fact uh, a cross. And it's not James and John that are on his left and his right, it's two criminals. In a, in a way, um, the whole ministry of Jesus um, is surprisingly different to what they expected. Absolutely. Yeah. Yes. Mm. It's, um, it's servant and... Uh, uh, compassionate and uh, in the background sort of, mm. um, yeah. Okay, these next questions uh, will, will probably blend into each other, the type of answer that, that you give, but I'll read it out. I like the way, Desiree, by the way, that you are able to bring from those Gospels tw nearly 2,000 years ago, that context and then what it means to us in our context. I think uh, it's marvellous the way that this can be brought up to date, so to speak. So uh, the question I have is, um, I'm, I'm congratulating you on your sermons. What's going on in society back there then when James and John and um, Jesus were having that little talk. What's this, this, something more of the society than what you've mentioned already? Okay, so it would have to, to we, I have to try to compress it and speak yeah. very briefly, but so for most of Israel's history, uh, that they've been in a time of oppression. Uh, you know, at one point it was the Assyrians in about 722 uh, BCE. They come and take the Jewish people into captivity. Then in about 585, the Babylonians come, take them into captivity. In 333, it's the Macedonian, well, you know, the Persians and then the Macedonians. Then there's a, a brief period where they have about a hundred years of freedom where they rule themselves. This is the period of the Hasmonean dynasty. It's a particular Jewish family that led them at the time. But they found that things in Jerusalem got a bit out of hand, so they appealed to help, for help, to the Romans. Ah. <laughs> uh, bad move. Yeah. <laughs> as that, as a really it bad out. move. Yeah. <laughs> yes. uh, yeah. As it turned out, the Romans said, uh, well, sure, we'll come in and help, and thank you very much, we'll, 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 we'll take we'll the sword. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, so they're under Roman uh, oppression at this time. And there's different views of the Roman Empire. Some people talk about the Pax Romana of it being quite a, a great period in history. 
Yep. Others remark about the shadow side of Roman Empire that, especially under Pontius Pilate, who was the prefect sent to Jerusalem, very, very harsh man. So some of the, the recent history is, you know, when there's an uprising uh, to inspire fear in the people to make sure it doesn't happen again, you know, they just hammered, you know, they would mm. just go in and, you know, arrest all the Jewish men and crucify them in, in, in one mm. foul, uh, foul sweep. So that w they were really hammered. So the, there is the living under constant violence, which, which is a significant aspect. And then there's the poverty because of a multi-leveled tax system, mm. paying tax not only to Rome, but paying the temple tax as well. And the whole religious institution was corrupt. So to maintain power, some of the temple authorities and even Herod, that's the issue with Herod, is they colluded with Roman power to maintain mm. Their, to maintain their power and, and influence. Okay. So, so when Jesus comes and speaks out against either the religious authorities or some aspects of Roman rule, Herod, everyone's nervous, <laughs> you know, because Pontius Pilate then calls Herod in and says, look, either you sort this out or I will. Yes, okay. um, so I also have some sympathy for Herod. He's caught between a rock and a hard place, I think. You know, mm. yes, he, yes, he reaps the rewards for being king in how he colludes with, uh, with the Romans. Um, but at the end of the day, he might be the lesser of two evils. You know, rather than direct rule mm. from Rome, he might be a bit of a buffer. And I also have some sympathy for the religious rulers because they have an interest in protecting the, the religious space. And, and so, you know, what do you do? It's, it's not an easy situation, but they make decisions that always favor the, the rich and the powerful and the, those with little influence. Yeah. And it's the vulnerable that pay the price for that. So I see that as a pattern that's repeated throughout history. So. Okay. Um, obviously, Jesus' message and so on is up against quite a bit of uh, baggage, you might say, of, or, uh, of all that sort of thing. Well, well he died, he died a, a political death. So if he was just an annoying preacher, they A, would have ignored him, or if he really got up their nostrils, they would have taken him, you know, behind yeah. the temple somewhere and just put a knife to yeah. him, problem sorted. Yeah. But they wanted to make a statement. So crucifixion is a very public uh, political death. Yeah. So that stands to reason. It's the ultimate proof that his message is largely political. Mm -hmm. Okay, another question. Jesus talks about a ransom for many. Oh, yes. I, w I wish that was never written down. <laughs> <laughs> yes. I reckon there's two or three layers to that question. Yes. You know, or answers to that question or yes. what's going on. Do you care to comment about any of those layers? Oh, yes. I mean, I, I do respect scripture, but I... I regret how much damage that those two lines have caused <laughs> in religious history. So it's a quote that Jesus makes. I, I think a similar, there might be a similar quote in Isaiah, but a ransom to many. So that's the basis of our atonement theory. So yeah. if Jesus is a ransom for many, who's the ransom paid to? Who's the kidnapper, as it were? So. For the first thousand years of church history, we said that the ransom was paid to the devil. Um, and then in about, yes, I see you pulling up your, <laughs> your no, they realized that couldn't be quite right. So in about th at the year 1100, a document is written called uh, Cur Deus Homo, which means why a God human. 
And the basic theory here is that the ransom is paid um, to God, that Jesus' death is a ransom for many, and the ransom is paid uh, to God. And that's where we have the atonement theory developed that Jesus dies in our place. Um, so that's been the basic teaching ever since the year 1000. And it's presented in a way that there are no alternatives. And I would suggest that I beg to differ. Mm. So uh, ransom to many, I, I do think it's metaphorical so within the context of how it happens in the, in the Bible, um, Jesus is saying to James and John, you, you know the Gentiles, when they are rulers, they lord it over each other, mm -hmm. but it's not, to be, it's not to be like that among you. Instead, the greatest among you must be the least, must be the servant of all. Well, the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve. Mm -hmm. that, that, I think, is the, the critical thing. So my reading of it is just the analogy, metaphor, if you like, of an escalator. So our society conditions us to imagine that life is an escalator and we're meant to be going up. You know, we're meant to be gathering more wealth, uh, more education. We're meant to be aiming for promotion all of that. Mm. And if we actually stop for just a minute and really think about that, that sort of lifestyle is actually really, really exhausting. It's exhausting to keep aiming for more. You know, you win one gold Olympic, the next time you go, you want to win two gold mm -hmm. <laughs> Olympics. And we're always pushing ourselves and we're so driven as a civilization. Uh, Jesus comes along and says, look, there is actually another way to live. Yeah. And that is the escalator down. And there's actually a huge freedom in that. There's a, a huge release and it is actually a really worthwhile, wonderful way to live. To, and I think it's how we are naturally programmed. I think we are naturally programmed naturally designed to seek joy for others. You know, when we create joy for others, that's when we feel most fully alive. Mm. Um, when we serve each other and someone else is touched by something that we've done, we feel truly, you know, we feel truly alive. And the best way to live life is to, is to love. I think that's our natural that's our natural state. I think it's conditioned out of us through society, through how we're educated. Mm. We, we give up our freedom to authority, for example. Mm -hmm. That's what, I know you're a teacher, forgive me, but that's what the education system is about. You know? mm. um, yeah, so if you can own your own inner freedom and you can own your natural tendency to be generous, to be kind, to be love, there, there's a huge freedom in that and it's as if you are set free because we've been kidnapped by this other system that's programmed into us by society and guess what <laughs> there's another way problem. to live yes <laughs> there's another way to live yeah, yeah. We, yeah we're starting to reap the fruits of our effort to always want more and it's really starting to hurt. And it comes in the form of ecological destruction and the effects that climate change have on us. Right. Um, it's, it's not fun to live through bushfires and floods yes. and all, all the rest of it. There's another way to live, which is we can be free. Yep. So I think it's an image about freedom rather than an image about his life being a sacrifice on our behalf, I would repudiate that in the in the strongest terms. Right. Mm. Right. Thank you for that. Um, I had a couple of other things here which you may like to comment on, but um, and please feel free. I, I really like the metaphor about the 
the, the great violin player. Yes. Yeah. Yes. So, uh, and him making wonderful music that was for the world. Mm. So I don't know whether you want to elaborate on that or um, for our viewers or... So the, the metaphor of the violin, so um, if they watched the, the sermon, I think it's explained there, but it, it just seems like a symbol for how some of us might be living our lives. We might be like um, a, a violin that's just an ornament. We have all these skills and innate abilities that lie dormant. And if we can be the Christ presence for others, and can give them the freedom to be themselves. Um, it's almost as if their potential is actualized, yeah. that their real self can come out and they can really sing. You know, they're then a violin that's, that's played. How is the violin played? Well, it's when you live into your, your true self, yeah. whatever that is, so. Beautiful uh, metaphor, yeah. isn't it? It is, yeah, it is. so I, I don't know what it is that keeps people from allowing themselves to be played. I think it might be fear, maybe it's self-doubt, maybe it's a lack of self-esteem, maybe they think they're not worthy. But if, if we can um, show them that they are loved, that they are worthy, yeah. they might be set free to allow their song to sing. Yeah. Mm. Very good. Um, you've talked about who shall be first and who will be last and so on. I know there's more can be said, but would you like to comment about the idea that outsiders quite often can look in on mm. the church, for instance, and see things more clearly than uh, yeah. uh, us trying to practice it? Yeah, definitely. So if you, if you read the theology of uh, Rowan, What's his surname? The Archbishop, the previous Archbishop of Canterbury, Rowan, it's not Williams, Atkinson. Isn't it? isn't it Williams? Yeah, not Atkinson, Williams, Rowan Williams. Yeah. Uh, he has that as one of his sources of theology is listening to secular wisdom. So the example that I would give is that, uh, there's actually several examples. So the one example is that d democracies like Europe, America, even Australia, and some other democracies, take it as self-evident that women can, you know, women can do whatever job it is that a, a man can do. So nowhere in, in our democracies do we prevent women from being a CEO or a banker. In fact, it's against the law to be prejudiced um, against women on the basis of their gender. But what do we have in some churches? <laughs> um, still in some churches today is this idea that uh, for some convoluted religious reason, uh, women can't be pastors or women can't hold office in the church. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, they, they can, however, serve the tea, <laughs> uh, clean the church and make cakes. You know, that still happens. So, their secular wisdom has something to, to teach the church. The other example is also with things like the issue of divorce. Uh, secular society was way ahead of the church in terms of offering a forgive, forgiveness and understanding and compassion on people who were divorced long before the church, which often offered um, Judgment. Judgment. Yeah. Um, yes, and perhaps a, another example is that the secular society is way ahead of many churches in terms of LGBTQIA plus rights. So again, s the church could learn from society what it means yeah, to about, about to be human and love, compassion, yeah. acceptance, tolerance inclusion, all of those things. Okay. Well, Desiree, you've answered a lot of questions. I, 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 have we covered enough? <laughs> yeah, I think so. Um, I was going to finish off by 
thanking you very much for no, thank you, Barry. your, thank you for your openness time. and uh, I think brilliance in the way that you uh, uh, can bring the meaning of the gospel from way back there into modern day context. Um, so uh, we get lots of pointers from things that you tell us in your sermons and similarly I'm sure for other pastors everywhere but, but uh, we really, um, what's the word, appreciate all that and you go away refreshed and enlivened and think yes I can do that and so on. Okay. So uh, today's talks just highlight a few of, of those insights that, that are part of God's world, part mm -hmm. of God's kingdom.